Greetings, it is I, Tantus Narvan Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome. It is time to continue our discussion on Werewolf the Apocalypse. Where we last left off, we were of course talking about some of the organizations of werewolves. Today I'm going to dive into that a little bit more, talk about their languages, and some of the other ways that they organize themselves together. Let's talk about dominance, because it's an important factor within werewolves. Werewolves, when they get together, can oftentimes find themselves at odds with each other. And contests of dominance will show who is superior over who. Oftentimes they occur at moots, places where these duels or challenges can take place. There are actually three types of challenges that usually occur. The first down is the face down where two opponents face them down and attempt to psych each other out. This is sort of the basic set of will. It's, it's the contest of will between two to see who is superior. The second is gamescraft. Gamescraft is all about a mental challenge. It might be something like a game of chess. It might be some kind of puzzles. But it is all about that mental acuity. And is oftentimes a challenge of dominance of, of course, intelligence. And of course, the last one is the duel. It is all-out combat. Rarely is it intentionally fatal. Of course, frenzy can occur and deaths do occur because of it. Now, the loser is supposed to show their submittance to the winner. If they should fail to do that, werewolf tradition oftentimes says the winner can do effectively what they like to the loser, oftentimes resulting in death. Now, Garu have a language of their own. It is one that they teach after the rite of passage to those that are there. It has a lot of words which are difficult to understand unless you're taught them. And there are those like the lunatics and lost cubs which will not understand it at all. They don't have that sort of exposure to it. And the thing is, it is known for both metaphors of sight and smell. So there are where it, the way it expresses is much different than what we would think expressions would be. It is also a language that both involves the words you speak and the body language you have. So mixing the two of those is critically important. Now, there are also certain words and sounds in language that would not work when spoken by a wolf or a human. You need to be somewhere in between. You need to be in one of those forms in the middle to even express these words. This is a learned language. Unlike the ability to speak to wolves when you're in either wolf form or near wolf form, this one you actually have to learn. That other ability is innate. Now let's talk about the howl. The howl is the ultimate expression of Garu, where when one starts, many will oftentimes join in. It is, they seek like harmony is disdained in this but cacophony is sought if one should match the pitch of another they will instinctively change the pitch so it is it has this cacophony sound the object is to make the group seem larger and there are a large number of howls that mean different things when you would use them each one has their own expression in relaying information and expressing this basically communication almost between the Garu. The book lists a number of types of howls that you may encounter and you might need to recognize. Now the most basic and the strongest group of Garu is the pack. The pack is a united group of Garu that may have different lineages, might have different tribes, but they're all united over a common goal which drives them together. This goal can be something that is specific and finite, or it could be something general and long-lasting. So packs can exist from anywhere from a few weeks to lifetimes. These are some of the deepest connections they can have between each other. They will die for each other. Individuals within the pack might have powerful rivalries with each other, but when it comes to shove, they will die for each other. This like dislike of each other means nothing under the rulership of the pack and oftentimes you will see packs moving in such ways that those that battle against them say they almost have this psychic connection between them it is just this close-knit bond of instinct which drives them together 
when a pack is formed. They traditionally summon a totem spirit to guide over it, something to be both a companion, to be a guide, to be a protector to them. And this companion, this totem spirit will accompany the pack until its dissolution, when it will be freed. The bonds of the pack are nearly unbreakable. Now if the pack are the friends you choose, lineage is the family you cannot escape. There are lines of werewolves which can form different levels of power. Elders in a line might try to punish or keep in line those that would bring shame to the line. They will do all this to keep things together. There are some lineages which are so powerful and well met, they are powers onto themselves. The thing about lineages, they are very useful though, though demanding. This sort of format, because it often involves kinfolk, is a great connection between Garo and humanity, and it is one of the more important ways that they connect together in this modern day. So lineage forms itself very important. Now a sept is the group of werewolves that live and protect a cairn. They, though many of these were originally single tribe, nowadays with the shrinking cairns, multi-tribal septs have actually begun to become more and more commonplace. And in fact, this, they are bastions of tolerance and amongst xenophobic and intolerant werewolves. They actually might be a hint at survival for werewolves, a sign of hope for them, these groups in amongst them. The sept perform a manage of political, religious, and various other ceremonies for werewolves, but they are primarily there to guard and protect the care. Many elder werewolves settle down to become seps to protect these cairns and then will employ younger garu as effectively their eyes and ears going out on missions of them for it for them in the world staying within the goodwill of a sept especially from your area is critically important they're the masters of the information will most likely know whatever is going on before you do now the largest organization within the garu society is of course the tribe better called the species of Gaur you are. Your tribe determines your cultural outlook, your upbringing, and oftentimes your physical characteristics. All of these will come into determining effectively what kind of tribe you're from. Tribes will often control territories of them their own and have philosophies which may or may not battle against other tribes' philosophy. One's auspice is in fact interpreted through their tribe. So, so the same auspice might be interpreted different ways within their tribe and reflect things differently within it. These make for more major differences between them. So that's it for today. I continued talking about the organization and society of Garu, of werewolves. I talked about dominance in werewolf society. Moving in from where I talked about alphas last week, I talked about their language. And then I moved into talking about three major groupings of werewolves. The pack, the closest knit group you can have. Your lineage, your bloodline, which may or may not be a large group. I talked about the sept, a group that protects the cairns. And of course, I talked about the tribes. In the next episode, I will talk about the 13 tribes of werewolves. And then I will also talk about the lost tribes of werewolves. Those that are dead. Hopefully moving into discussing Ronin. So if any questions, comments, anything you want to say, anything you think I left out, please just leave it in the comments below. Remember to like, share, and of course, subscribe. It shows your support for the channel, the Empire, and the work I do. If you want to show some extra support for the channel and the Empire, you can check out my Patreon, linked in the description below. But regardless, until the next time, I bid you farewell.